great time with Stephen. Thank you. And I'm talking more about um, the Cloud Native Compute Foundation and how they've integrated storage into um, Kubernetes um, and how storage has evolved since the original concepts of Docker volume plugins and how that's converted into um, native Kubernetes drivers and then finally into CSI, um, which Bart talked about a minute ago. So what, what this really is is about if you're deploying containers and you need to run stateful apps, how do you do it? What are your options? And um, what, uh, um, what are the frameworks and orchestrators that you use to make that happen? Um, just a little bit about me. Um, I've been doing storage for the last 24 years. I started at EMC. I'm an electrical engineer by training um, and did lots of consulting and implementation and design. Moved into the uh, pre-sales and, and architect side of the business and um, this is my fourth startup. So have a lot of experience working with um, mainly large customers and been very focused on um, high availability database applications. Um, so my perspective is um, not necessarily the big data space. Um, really um, what our company is focused on and, and what my career is focused on is, is primary data. So what do you do when you have a database that's transactional, that's real time, that end user, users or automated systems are integrating with? So it's a slightly different focus than the stuff Barb was talking about, but a lot of the, the concepts were the same. Um, I also do a lot of stuff around uh, networking and the networking that uh, is used to enable this. So I can speak about how networking and storage integrate um, as well. So. Um, when storage started out, or when, when containers started out, there was this concept of microservices and containers being stateless. What that actually meant is that people built stateless apps in containers and they had databases external. Um, the problem with that is that the beauty of containers is they're portable and many applications were built with um, Docker or Kubernetes with stateless apps. And uh, when a data center fills up, the first thing you move to the cloud is the portable app. But the database behind it was sitting in VMware or in a database cluster, and you ended up with um, orphan databases, high latency, poor performance, and people move things back. So the, the concept of persistent storage and, and this, uh, this idea of um, stateless microservices is, is a really good idea, and when Google donated um, Kubernetes to the Cloud Native Compute Foundation, they had this wonderful concept of a globally available database. But I think almost anyone else doesn't have that. They have Oracle, or SQL, or MySQL, or Mongo, or Postgres, or uh, Cockroach, or Couchbase, or Redis, or any of the 400 flavors of databases that run in containers, and none of them are globally available without some sort of underlying layer. So that's why persistent storage has become very important. It's something that Docker has addressed through a Docker volume plugin, but it's something that Kubernetes and CSI have taken to the next level. So most of what we're going to talk about is really uh, Docker Kubernetes rather than um, native Docker because of the lack of orchestration. Um, but the first thing is, the, the whole idea that, that containers are stateless isn't true. So you can, you can pretend that microservices make your life really easy, but all it's really doing is moving the problem around. And if you don't acknowledge the fact that you need to manage the data with the application, then you're just going to end up with problems because if you have a portable application, you need portable data behind it. The next concept is around pets. So there's a very famous article that talks about pets versus cattle and how you need to have servers that are disposable. Um, by creating local volume plugins, by mapping the data from a container to the local disk in a server without some sort of storage orchestration around it, you create a storage pet. And really that's a, a set of data that can only run on that server. And if you know anything about containers, the whole concept is that they move on a regular basis, often, between servers, between nodes. And if you create that dependency, 
you break this whole model and you create a storage pad. And that's completely unworkable in a containerized world. Uh, so what needs to happen is the data needs to follow the, the application. And actually, that's not a simple problem because actually sometimes the data is much bigger than the application itself and is a much harder problem to move. It's much harder to restart. It's uh, much more difficult to maintain performance with large data sets moving around in a cluster. So these are the key fundamental issues that um, we're trying to solve when we're talking about persistent storage. And actually, the issues are the same whether you're using them for big data or for primary data. Um, but the, the order of magnitude or the scale can be very different. Uh, I know Mark talked about using um, smaller databases in um, Portworks and using Cassandra in the larger data sets on physical disk that's very reflective of the nature of the scale of the problem. And what the industry is trying to solve is how do you manage the end-to-end -end solution so that availability, um, uh, data placement, uh, data pooling is all managed centrally, whether it's on uh, local disk or remote disk. So, and, and then the final issue is about people. Um, people are the most expensive part of your organization and your infrastructure, and they're the least reliable. So um, any time that you ask someone to do something 400 times, they will do it wrong at least once, probably 30, 40, 50, 100 times. So um, people are not good at recurrent, reliable, repeated tasks. So the other thing about doing orchestration is it's not just about orchestrating the app, it's about orchestrating the storage, the connectivity of that storage, the durability of that storage, and the performance of that storage. So this is something that is a big change in an organization, but it's a big opportunity for cost savings because legacy enterprise storage teams have very skilled people who spend lots of time configuring and provisioning storage. And in a large organization, it's very common for a volume to be created in four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks. If you're a developer and you need to make a change in your configuration and you've got to wait six or eight weeks to do that, what are you going to do for six weeks? Your project's going to be late, you're going to work on something else, you're going to lose your train of thought. That's not context switching, that's just fatal. So um, the whole idea is that storage needs to be orchestrated and automated so that you can do it yourself. So with this backdrop, we really look at um, the concept of cloud-native storage. So everyone's familiar with cloud-native apps, yeah? Have you heard the term, understand what a cloud-native app is? So in the simplest level, cloud-native storage is storage that supports and enable um, those cloud-native applications. But there's, there's more detail to that. So the CNCF sat down, they, they have a, um, a storage working group, and the storage working group said, what is cloud-native storage and what does uh, um, persistent volume um, claim need to deliver to an application to allow that application to be cloud native. And they've defined eight key principles, and these are really important. So the first one is that storage needs to be application centric. If you're delivering a volume to an operating system, that's not application centric because the most unstable part of an operating system is the IO subsystem. And when you connect a volume, um, something like uh, an iSCSI or a Fiber Channel one, it's the most likely thing to crash a server. So it's things that um, you always do in change control out of hours with approval is any sort of IO subsystem changes. So in order to deliver a cloud native app that can move and scale and be agile, you need to do things at the application level. That's a change in the architecture that um, things like EBS don't do. If you disconnect an EBS volume and reconnect it to another server, it can take up to an hour to connect. If you disconnect an iSCSI one and connect it to another server, it can take 10 to 20 minutes to do that. So these are complex things, and that level of the infrastructure isn't the right place to do it, and, and that's probably the most fundamental concept about looking at storage and containers, is you can't do LUNs. You have to do volumes or file systems, and you have to do them at the volume level within the application. 
The next thing is about platform agnostic. So almost every enterprise customer we're dealing with has a cloud first or a hybrid cloud strategy. So um, someone asked earlier about why did you build the infrastructure. Um, really simply put, it has to do with compliance and regulation. Um, there, are every, there are things from GDPR in Europe to um, uh, financial services regulations across hundreds of countries that uh, require data residency, um, data locations, encryption, all of these things that prevent people from using public cloud for some data sets. Now, lots of people want to use public cloud for lots of things because it gives them flexibility, it gives them agility, it gives them cost savings, but they just can't do it. But what they need to do is be able to build apps in the cloud and deploy them on premise in a virtual machine environment or physical environments on existing SAN environments and in cloud environments have it be consistent. If an application is portable, can move around those environments, the, um, uh, the storage needs to be able to do so as well. The next thing is everybody loves YAML. Has everyone, anyone here not written a YAML file before? So everyone can, can build an application, can create a, a definition of an application. The one thing that's missing, you can configure an application, you can configure the CPU, you can configure the memory, you can configure the network and the bandwidth. Without persistent storage, you can't configure the disk, so it's kind of a useless application. So you need to make storage describable and composable in code. So we're making the provisioning of storage code-based, and um, it's not just um, from the CLI that you need to do that. You also need to make it programmatically controllable. Lots of people are building apps that scale. You have a desired state and you want to um, have a Christmas sale and the number of instances of your applications go from 12 to 200 in two minutes because people are logging on and buying their Christmas presents. You don't want 200 servers to do that, so you use the cloud and you auto-scale that. Well, those 200 servers are now creating 200 times the amount of database traffic. So your back-end storage needs to scale as well, and you need to be able to tell the storage system to scale that programmatically. It's completely different than that eight-week provisioning cycle that you would have had with a traditional storage array. So it has to be API-driven. You have to be able to talk to your um, uh, container storage array through an API and tell it to add a volume, clone a volume, replicate it, scale it, etc. So all of those, um, those are the first four. Um, and those are focused on the infrastructure and the architecture side. The, the next four are really focused on the operations side. So um, the fundamental assumption of DevOps is that developers are doing operations tasks, the, the clues in the name. So um, if you're building something with uh, a person with multiple skill sets, they probably don't have the depth of expertise of the person that used to do only that all day long every day. So what you need to do is automate and guarantee that the core compliance and service level functions of a storage environment are implemented automatically. So the first is security. There's a big problem in the cloud space today from an enterprise perspective that all encryption is implemented with the cloud provider owning the keys. So GDPR went into effect earlier this year, um, and that means that no European company can have data um, exposed without permission of the, um, uh, the, the owner or the, the person responsible for their data. Um, but if you give access to your, uh, if you encrypt your data in AWS, Google, or um, Azure, you're giving your keys to the US company. Um, they've got the ability to decrypt your data and they've got the requirement that the government asks for it in the US to provide the data to um, to the US government. So no bank in Europe is allowed to use cloud providers encryption, so they'll have to deploy their own. So security becomes a really big deal in the cloud, but it's also a big deal even on-prem because there are all kinds of issues. Vodafone had um, a, a site broken into a couple of years ago and 200 disks stolen that had email on it and lots of emails circulated. We hear all the time about data breaches, but data needs to be encrypted and that security needs to happen automatically. Um, yeah? Doesn't it differ per region, your cloud provider? For example, is, is Ireland might be allowed, but 
uh, US, foreign US might not be around, according to regulations. So, so, so op op operationally, they say they don't have the right to use those keys, but they still have them. So if someone not following the process can access your data, and it's not the the, be the well-behaved person you're concerned about, it's the person that's taking that key and, and acting in a malicious way that you're trying to protect yourself against. Okay. Because, because I've seen a couple of banks using the public cloud. They do, but not with, not with customer-sensitive data. Okay. Uh, almost every single bank uses the public cloud for development efforts, or um, uh, data that's been anonymized. But, what about transaction data? Uh, it, it, what they do is they have to do an anonymization process. So you have a lookup table. It uses uh, a customer reference number. The customer reference number maps the data that's stored in a local database, not in the cloud. So if you got access to the data, you could see the transaction value, but you wouldn't know who did the transaction. OK, that's weird. I do know of banks which are migrating transaction mm -hmm. data to the public cloud, uh, like existing transaction data, without mm -hmm. anonymizing. They, well, then, they then have real compliance problem. issues. No, so I, I'm very curious yeah. about those compliance. And, and yeah, it could be as well, well. it's in the local ability, so for example, in Europe. Yeah. It could be. Okay. Okay, so like Amazon and Microsoft, they have their affiliate zones in Europe, so they guarantee that the data will stay in Europe. Yeah. So that is a, a possibility. Yeah. That was what I what I cross affiliate zones. Uh, that will be resolved. Okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. Um, the, the the next the next key point is agility. So you guys love containers because it makes your life easy. You can change things. And changing things means they don't go down, they keep running. So storage needs to do the same. That's actually a really alien concept to storage administrators. Anytime you make a change to a volume in an EMC array, you take the volume offline, you resize the volume, oftentimes you back up the volume, you destroy it, you create a larger volume, you restore the data. Um, so being able to dynamically provision um, resize, change, and even change the performance, the, the performance tier of your data is something that a cloud native app requires. And this is what the CNCF is defining, and this is what companies like ourselves, Storage OS, and CoreWorks, and, and others are implementing because this is the standard that the CNCF has published around cloud native storage is. Um, the next thing is performance, and this is a particular issue with distributed storage arrays. So as I said, we're focused on um, uh, very high performance um, front end data. So we're doing um, full volume replicas, but um, products like Ceph and Gluster that are object stores have real challenges delivering performance in um, failure scenarios because you're rebuilding disk from parity um, out of the CPU. So um, the ability to deliver consistent performance regardless of outage is, is probably the biggest single technical challenge in um, the cloud native storage space. And then finally, availability. So um, we, we talked about um, uh, Apache NiFi and being able to fill that over. There are actually a lot of databases that either don't have um, uh, a highly available option or that highly available option costs 10 times the support license. So um, this is a big problem for smaller organizations. If you want um, to run MySQL, um, the database license for the single instance is one-fifth the cost of the, of the HA instance. So um, if you can build a solution that delivers the high availability, you don't need to buy the expensive enterprise license to get that high availability out of it. And that pays for the cognitive storage solution on its own. So, so those are the eight things that make up cloud native storage, and that's what all the vendors are being expected to deliver. Um, so if we look at how this integrates with the different platforms, the first one to deliver persistent storage was Docker, because they were the first to market. Um, and the whole concept was that you had stackable layer images and then um, container copy on write. So you had a container image and you had the ability to add differences to that container image and you were able to clone that. So um, that gave you an application layer way to manipulate the data, but it was very, very slow um, and uh, it was not ever really used because it, it didn't 
actually deliver a lot of great functionality. So um, the next thing that they came up with was a local named volume. So this is what we call a storage pet. So you create a volume and that volume is available on the node and the containers that are running on that node can read that volume and you separate the data by directory, by container. That has two major problems. One, security, because you could have different customers running on the same node if you're a service provider and they would have access to each other's data and there's no security solution there. But really the big problem is as soon as that container moves, it loses all its data and it doesn't start. So this solution wasn't very workable either, so they abandoned that. Very easy to create, Docker volume create my data, and then you run the container on that volume, and it has access to its data off the local hard drive. Um, and then you can read and write to that volume. Um, so what evolved um, about 2015 was this concept of Docker volume plugins, and this was how cloud native storage devices talk to a Docker cluster. And what it allows you to do is define a, um, a volume that is portable in something they call the global namespace. And it allows you to create the volume. And I use storage OS commands, but you could use Portworks or um, Cluster um, or an NFS mount, all are supported. And um, once you've defined the volume and the size, you just run that on that volume. And now anywhere the data lives, Anywhere the container runs, they'll be able to access the data. Um, the one thing that you have to consider here um, that Bart mentioned is network performance. So um, Portworks uh, centralizes the volume. Um, our, our product is really focused on running the volume on the same node as the cluster. Um, uh, cluster and Ceph also have similar connectors. NetApps has a connector called Trident. They're all focused on big centralized storage appliances. Those all require network latency. If you look at the order of magnitude difference between the backplane speed and the ethernet speed within a data center, the more you can keep locally, the better performance you get. So the problem with this is once you create a volume, it's stuck on the server. So in Docker and in Docker Swarm, there are lots of issues with volume plugins and delivering storage performance. So the first key message here is that if you're interested in delivering cloud-native applications, Swarm is probably not the best way to go because cloud-native storage works, but it doesn't work exceptionally well, and it's a bit problematic. And almost every major customer, whether it's on-prem or in cloud um, or in the managed cloud services, are all have all gone Kubernetes. So I'm going to spend a bit more time looking at how Kubernetes did because they took a look at the volume plugin framework and they said this isn't working. How do we do it better? Um, and they created this concept of persistent volumes. And uh, you had a developer and they created a claim to the persistent volume and um, they could use that disk. This was the first implementation. Uh, it still exists, um, but it was kind of 0.7 within Kubernetes. The, the issue with this persistent volume claim framework is you have to pre-provision everything. So it's not exactly dynamic provisioning because you need to know how big the volumes need to be and where they need to be. And um, while it allows you to dynamically map, it doesn't do any dynamic creation. So um, once you make the claim, you uh, reference that in your pods. You've got um, everything except agility, really, um, in this solution. Um, so the next thing that came out is storage classes, and this is where we are today, which allows you to define dynamic volumes, and this is a very important concept, because now you can create storage on the fly from pools. You can pre-provision the pools, or depending on your product, the product will create the pool and expand the pool for you manually or automatically, depending on what you choose. Um, but all you need to do is define classes. So this gives you tiering. You have uh, SSD disk, um, hard disk, um, uh, object stores, etc. And then your developer does exactly what they did before, but instead of making a claim off of a named persistent volume, they make a claim off of a storage class. And then Kubernetes uses the storage API to pass that volume through and the volume is serviced by the persistent volume requester. So the developer doesn't need to know anything about the storage product underneath. They just need to know a common reference to 
um, a storage class. So it makes it very simple, it makes it interchangeable, you can use different persistent uh, volume requesters in the same environment if you need to do so. And the syntax is really simple. So what you're going to do is you're going to create the storage class. You're going to um, create a namespace. This is what provides the security and segregation of traffic um, for a multi-tenanted environment. And then you're going to make a, a claim off of the, um, uh, off of the storage class, um, in this case, fast. Um, and it will create that volume. Um, the nice thing about our product is we do everything to provision. That's not defined in the specification, but most storage vendors do that. Um, so what you end up doing is enabling your developer to build their own volumes in real time and map it to the right kind of storage that they want to use and uh, consume that storage immediately. Um, the other really nice thing about this is that those volumes are available on every node. So you have the concept of the global namespace, and uh, you have the concept of replicas in all of the products, and either you have data locality or you have a shared pool, it doesn't matter how you implement it, you've got access to the volume. And what differentiates the different products in the space is how they handle that replication and the failover process. But that's not governed by Kubernetes. That's governed by the implementation that the storage vendors have chosen. Um, so some, some vendors have volume. It lives where it lives and it connects across the network. Um, we uh, provide that volume locally on each node. So we move the master around, which means you're always using local disks, so you always have the best performance. But that's a, that's a um, vendor-specific implementation rather than a Kubernetes thing. So um, Bart talked a lot about what works and how they do things. I think that the big difference between what, what we're trying to do and what Portworks is trying to do is, is the use case focus. So use case is very, the use case that Portworks is focusing on is uh, around the big data space mainly. We're focused on primary databases, a lot of SQL and NoSQL databases, and, and really it's about delivering the production workloads to those customers. So um, making sure that uh, they have the performance and the agility they need in Kubernetes, but not just in Kubernetes, but also in other environments. So um, the Container Storage Initiative is a really important um, uh, working group. It's actually separate to Kubernetes and it works across um, uh, Mesos. It was originally set up by Mesosphere, but it works across Mesos DCOS, um, uh, Kubernetes, and um, Pivotal today. Um, as Bart said, Docker is looking at joining, um, but Ranchers also got support for it as well. So um, it's, a, it's a standards based API. The, the challenge that um, uh, the Kubernetes core maintainers were having was that um, when we built our requester and Portworx built their requester, you actually have to open source and mainline your entire storage driver. So if you install Kubernetes today, you get a Portworx driver, you get a storage OS driver, you get um, uh, a Ceph driver, and you get a cluster driver. So you're installing a lot of drivers that you may or may not want. Um, and that becomes impossible when you look at the potential number of storage vendors and maintaining the upstream. So CSI allows a single shared API to support that, and it allows the uh, API to pass commands down to the individual storage vendor. And what we've done with that at Storage OS is allowed you to uh, implement uh, a rules-based engine to automate the placement, the security, and the management of, of your volumes so that 